Well, thank you so much, musicians here. Mike, appreciate your leading here this morning. It is a blessing to be able to come and to worship our God and uh, surround ourselves with uh, believers that uh, truly um, are seeking to grow in their faith. And we've been excited to have Dr. Steve Silverstein with us here this weekend. Uh, Steve's done about five hours worth of teaching, uh, Friday and Saturday, and, and today he's been very busy as well. Uh, Dr. Steve uh, has uh, three offices where they conduct Christian counseling. Uh, two of them are Pennsylvania, and one is in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And uh, so he's taken some time away from his family, away from his, uh, his work to be with us. We really appreciate your willingness to, to do that. I'm a little disappointed, however, I have to confess I, I was hoping that there would be something in the material on marriage that might address when your wife is an Eagles fan and you're a Patriots fan. And uh, being able to reconcile, I thought when he got to that reconcile part, we'd be able to a address that. And uh, the, at least there's no conflict too much in baseball because, you know. Who's in the World Series? Never mind. I'm reminded of uh, Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 20. It says, listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. Amen. And it is our desire that we would live in a fallen world full of pain, full of, at times, outright discouragement. But we would live wisely, and we would live in a way that pleases the Lord. And I so appreciate uh, Steve coming and being with us this weekend as he has been able to take uh, many very specific areas that affect us in our lives and in our world. He's helped us to focus and to be able to understand uh, how to walk this journey as we live in a fallen world and really what to expect and to be able to endure at times the difficulty. But he's also really loaded us up with some great biblical principles that affect us in our marriage and in our relationships around us. And so I really appreciate that that a great deal. And so uh, I know the message today will be an encouragement to you this morning, and uh, trust that uh, as Steve comes that our hearts will be open to the Word as he brings it today. Thank you, Pastor. It is a thrill to be here. Uh, I consider it a, a true honor and a privilege that I would be considered a, a, a servant of God, that he, he would allow me this privilege to open up his Word with people. I never take it for granted, especially when a pastor opens up his pulpit. He's, you know, your shepherd, and he, he looks after you, and uh, to entrust you to, to me is uh, always a sacred privilege and an honor and a blessing, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, as, we, as we go forward, um, uh, we are living in a troubled world, and uh, we need to anticipate opposition. And uh, this hour, we're going to talk about... Uh, some of, some of the ways in Scripture it talks about the opposition. Uh, it talks about taking the beam out of your own eye, your own blind spots. You don't know what's going on. And, and our own ignorance, our, our own rebellion, taking the, those beams out of our eye um, can help us see a whole lot better and uh, stop worrying about the, the moat that's in someone else's eye. Um, that's one way of talking about the, the hindrance. Also, the Scriptures talk about having a stumbling block, um, that we can get tripped up, and we can. And I don't want to be a stumbling block to anybody, and I want to recognize the stumbling blocks that are in my life that I need to get to overcome. Uh, the scriptures say we are overcomers, so uh, I, I don't want to wait to overcome. The sooner I get done with these, uh, these stumbling blocks that need to be found victory over, uh, the more like Christ I'll be, the better we'll grow. And so I'm really interested in finding that for myself and sharing it with you. Um, besides being beams in our eyes and stumbling blocks, also the Word of God calls them hindrances. Luke uh, uh, talks about it in the 11th chapter, first 52nd verse. It talks about, that, you know, wh why are we being hindered? So Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, Friday morning, we started off with the idea that uh, there's going to be problems. Uh, there's going to be pain, suffering, and it's confusing. You know, hey, if I'm a child of the king, why? You know, is suffering necessary? And uh, um, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through uh, 6 or 7, wind up saying that... Um, uh, the God of all comfort will comfort us in all our trials and tribulations. Uh, we use the, I have five T's, trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and troubles. Uh, that's what we're expected. That's the appropriate expectation of the Christian life, not a rose garden. 
So um, th that says when we're fighting those trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and troubles, you got that? Um, God's going to be our comforter when we're in the middle of that difficulty, that pain, that suffering, that he will be our comforter to come alongside and help carry the load and get us over those, those hindrances. And uh, then he says, uh, Paul's, he does that for Paul, and, and so he comforts Paul, and then Paul writes that he comforted the Corinthians, and now he's urging the Corinthians to be comforters. So uh, uh, my my call to all of us is that we become comforters to those that are struggling. And uh, we wonder, you know, is that, what's the benefit? You know, how long do we do this? What, what's the deal on that? And uh, we looked at Lamentations, and uh, uh, Lamentations says God doesn't waste any pain. He says, uh, if you're hurting, it's not for naught, it's not for nothing, that God doesn't waste any pain, and good can come out of that. And uh, some of the good for us, that when we, when we do that, in uh, first. Uh, um, Timothy chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 it says when we get there it'll be he, God's going to bless us because of our faithfulness and not just receiving his comfort but also passing it on to others so uh, we're going to have glory when we get to heaven he's going to put the spotlight on us and there's going to be glory for us that we are faithful in, in giving offering up comfort and uh, there's going to be honor uh, and recognition for us so uh, the problem is that ain't today it's in the future it's for another time and, uh, but in the meantime, uh, one day when we get to heaven at the return of Christ, when that happens, uh, great, I'm listening, any trumpets playing today? Uh, you know, at the sound of the trump, the dead in Christ shall rise. It's, what a great deal. At that time, we're going to find out no pain was wasted, but right now we have to walk by faith. And so it's tough, it's a challenge to walk by faith and trust that God's God. Uh, we talked about God being big God, creator God. So I like God God. In the beginning was God God, not many gods of this cr world, man-made man in some cases, and, but uh, true living God, how big and strong and powerful God God is. And so I, I want to emphasize that in my life so I realize when I'm talking about that, what am I talking about? And uh, so... Uh, um, a lot of the pain and suffering comes from sinfulness, and uh, because of sin, sinfulness leads us to salvation. We need salvation, and salvation includes, uh, when we're one of God's kids, it includes this journey of suffering, which can lead to sanctification or walking in holiness, uh, dying daily, picking up the cross, uh, abiding in Him, all those different expressions that talk of us being hand in hand with our God, who will never leave us or forsake us, and who loves us till the end of the world, and we can never be separated from the love of God. Uh, I wonder if anybody here believes this. Amen? Uh, well, some of you are still sleeping. Wait, we already had a cup of coffee. Anybody believe that? Amen? Amen. Thank you. I, I feel better now, like you're, you're really awake and you're, you're, you're pretending to be engaged, so that's a good thing. Um, the, uh, so uh, the, the, the theme this morning is all the obstacles. What would trip you up? What would hinder you from getting where God wants us to go? What would stop us uh, from resisting healing, grace. What would cause us to stop that? And uh, my experience is, uh, especially in a counseling room, I want to know what's hindering God's kids from overcoming. And uh, I just think sometimes we're in a mess and we, we just don't get the overcoming done. Um, there's all kinds of uh, things going on in, in the world today that scars us up pretty bad. And so what happens when I know there's something within myself that's messing up, what I want to do is be able to identify what's, what is my sin. And sometimes it takes an outsider, uh, certainly family, my wife, sometimes friends and, and brothers in Christ to say, hey, Steve, you're messing up. And I'm sick and tired of being stupid. You know, I've done stupid in my life way too much. And so now when someone confronts me, hey, Steve, you, you know, you better take a look at this. Are you being stupid again? And, I say, and, and then I say, so I say, thank you. I mean, I don't know how many of us are open to criticisms and judgments and, and, and evaluations of other people. And now they're going to be judged by whatever they judge me with. They're going to be judged too, but I don't care about so much about them. I, I want to be heavenly minded. I, I want to set my affections on things above. And I want to have the mind of Christ we talked about yesterday. And so I want those things. So I'm, I'm like in communion with God. I want to be in harmony with him. So what gets in the way? And we have a list. There's no fill in the blank on this part uh, as we go through it. But the, there's no less than 13 different things that I experience, 13 hindrances, 13 stumbling blocks, 13 beams that hang out my eye that I want to have removed from my life so I can be an overcoming. I want to be a conqueror, the God says. I want to conquer over evil as I do this. I want to have victory over others and certainly the wicked one. 
So I want to be able to confess and repent. And uh, there, there's a book I, 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 I have to apologize. I guess it's sold out. There's going to be a sign-up sheet that really helps. Uh, uh, if you want it and didn't get a copy, I want everybody to have one. I just did, didn't realize the size of your church and everything became ill-equipped, uh, ill-prepared to hand out. But if you sign up, and we'll mail down a case of books for you guys that, that do want one. It, it talks about in there some common misunderstandings, things that people don't get about the healing journey. The truth is... Um, People say when there's an obstacle, a hindrance, or someone hurts me, because betrayal happens in the church, people in the fall, for church fall for all many reasons, embezzlement, infidelity, all kinds of problems in the church. I pray God will protect your church. Uh, God has put our church through infidelity and uh, financial problems. There's been a lot of problems in our church. It's healing now. We're several years past all the trauma of it, and it's alive and well, and, and we're sad. We're broken hard for some of the, 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 the sins that crept in, but um, I we can't forget, and some people says, you know, we want to just forgive and forget, and, but the truth is you can't forget. We certainly forgive, and I love when there's repentance and restoration, reconciliation. Those are big things, and forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. Uh, forgiveness is an economic term in Scripture. In Matthew 18, the king forgave 10,000 talents, as the King James, and then the other servant was forgiven 100 pence, or a day's wage, versus a year's wage. And so um, forgiveness is canceling the debt, but the problem is we don't know how to calculate a, a sin debt. How much do you owe when there's infidelity or betrayal? How, how, much, how much do you owe, spiritually speaking? And uh, the Help for the Hurting Heart book really talks about when, when and, and it's worse when you get betrayed by someone that you love and was supposed to protect you and, and, and keep you, and then they hurt. And in the church uh, of the numbers that we have here from the first service to this service, I know there's people here that have been betrayed by loved ones. It's just the sin. I'm not condoning it, but I always want to know, how do I heal from this stuff? And if I, I know someone that is hurting, how can I help guide them on this journey of healing and canceling the sin debt and pardoning, forgiving, not forgetting, but are they safe to reconcile? Reconciliation may not happen. You know, I, w I don't want a, a pedophile to babysit my grandkids. You know, we just don't. So there has to be safety going on with that thing. Uh, have mercy. Hurt people hurt people. Um, I work with both perpetrators and victims. Both are hurting. Both have different healing journeys. And I want to keep people safe. But it's part of the world today, unfortunately. But we have healing grace that can help people uh, overcome sins and, and wounds. But there's a lot of hindrances. So there are a lot of common misunderstandings. If I can't forgive, uh, then I, maybe I didn't forget. If I, if I forgive someone, then I can't acknowledge that the, face, the, the offense ever happened. No, if you forgive, it validates that the offense did take place. If it doesn't feel comfortable, then I must not be doing something right. My understanding is surgery and the healing journey, whether it be physically, medically, or spiritually, the healing journey is painful. And, but God doesn't waste the pain, but it is painful. Um, if things look hopeless, they must be hopeless. Those are some of the thoughts that people say, you know, I, they'll, they'll never repent. I still believe in miracles, and by the grace of God, I get to see repentance and change and reconciliation and restoration. Uh, people say, I don't want to go on this healing journey, you know, because I just can't do it anymore. The thought of it terrifies me, you know, but the person would only hurt me again. And uh, the person is old or they're dead. It was a long time ago, but the broken person still needs healing. Some people say, that's just kid stuff. I don't get it. What's the point? Um, there's no hope. It doesn't matter. All these different arguments on why we won't go through the healing journey, and uh, they're, they're not good. Um, so we use coping behaviors. Sometimes people have to find some coping. If someone hurt me, what do I do to protect myself? Uh, some people just say, oh, poor me. You know, they're complaining, and they use that uh, victim mindset. I'm just a victim. What can I do about it? No, there are things you can do about being a victim, because I don't want to be a victim. I'm a victorious in Christ, not a victim. Uh, some people use anger and rage. Every person I know that rages, they're hurting, and they're angry at the moment, but rage, you know, it's one thing to be hurt. It's another thing to be angry or mad. That, that's an emotional experience, but rage to me is that outspoken, that, that acting out anger, anger, that's anger management now, and so it's the, it's the activity that goes along with hurt feelings. Uh, every rager I know is hurting, so it doesn't make them right, but uh, they, there's still a healing journey available to them. 
And so uh, some people are just mean and sarcastic and belittling and, and shaming of others because they don't know what else to do with it and because the church of the living God has all these hindrances and we don't know how to get past it, so they resist the journey. I don't want you to resist the journey. As we go through our list in a few minutes, I want you to think about which one do I most identify with, and I'll be honest, I'm going to share which one I most identify with and say, if the other 12 could be mine a different day, a different week, but I know those things hinder me from the healing journey God intended. Remember, Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted, not the broken leg, not the broken arm, but he came to bind up the brokenhearted. That means he's expecting you and me, we got busted up hearts. And how does that happen? From our parents, our siblings, you know, the, the, the church, how, we, we got busted up hearts. That's why he came to restore and give us healing. He came to restore the brokenhearted. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, um, uh, and we can rationalize our way out of it. Oh, it never really happened. Oh, I can't feel the pain anymore, so it must not be broken uh, until you get triggered. Then you feel the pain again. Um, I can pretend the pain was never there. Um, uh, self-delusion, it's not that bad. Um, I'm, not worried. I'm not worthy to feel my true feelings. Some people just feel smashed down so bad by their, their parents and family of origin. Uh, my expression I've used multiple times this weekend is my parents said, stop your crying before I give you something to cry about. Well, I'm crying because I'm hurt. But they stop your crying before I give you something to cry about. So that tells me, my mommy and daddy, who say they love me, tell me to stop feeling my feelings. Boy, does that create a mess up inside. Then I'm not genuine and authentic. Now I, I pretend to be who they want me to be, and I'm not authentic. I'm not transparent. I'm not vulnerable. I'm not allowed to be Stephen anymore. I have to be who my parents say I am. Boy, will that mess you up. And so I think there's a lot of that that goes around in our, in our neighborhood. Um, and uh, we get false messages, like when I start telling them that, no, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong. Um, you're no good. You're not good enough. It's your fault. Uh, quit feeling so sorry for yourself. Uh, you stop. Uh, you should have done something to prevent this from happening. It's like when someone gets victimized, you know, the first thing stupid people do uh, is go after the victim and say, well, w why did you let him do it? It's your fault. You must have done something wrong to deserve such a thing. Dumber than dumb. Um, but uh, just get over it. Oh, that hurts. Uh, stop thinking about it so much. Forget the past. Those things aren't happening. Those are all kinds of goofy false messages that we wind up getting, and uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that. Now there's a list of my infamous 13. Um, as we uh, start looking at this, um, these are things I believe that we need to find a way to overcome. I don't think they all one size fits all. I think one or two or more of these might fit you. But not, I hope not all of them, but they're coping mechanisms. Um, but, and I don't want you to sit there, I, because this is such an intimate subject, and we talk about the, the, what, can, what we grab onto that stops us from growing in Christ. I don't want any elbows. And you don't even have to raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. Just you, you invite the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to show you how these issues uh, can get resolved so I can be whole in Christ. That, that's the goal. And uh, uh, if you were here for the previous couple of days, then you'll understand this is the answer to why I'm not getting done what we've talked about. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. I'm not getting it done. Why? These are all the hindrances that hinder us from doing what we've studied already in the Word of God. This is what I need to be doing. So what are some of the hindrances? Uh, I start off with number one, spiritual depletion. Are you filling up your spiritual tank? And I'm convinced my spiritual tank does not get filled up on Sunday mornings. I do Sunday school class, say adult Bible fellowship. I go to church. That is not where I get my filled cup. It doesn't. I love church. I love the preaching. I love our pastor. I appreciate our ABF, all that good stuff. Uh, that, that in and of itself doesn't fill my cup. I need an intimate personal relationship with God Almighty. I need God. I need Jesus. I need that connection from him in prayer. How often do you talk to God? Now, I thank God because of my job, uh, my, my ministry. I'm a counselor, so I, I counsel with people every hour of the day. So, you know, whether it's six hours or eight hours or 10 or 12 hours during the days. Uh, and whenever I meet with somebody and we talk about spiritual issues, if I don't start with prayer, which I don't always, but I certainly end with prayer, so I'm praying, talking to God during the time. God, I don't know how to help this fella. I don't, this lady, I, man, I, this is different. I don't know what to do for her. Would you please? And I'm amazed how God is so faithful. And if you ask in, in faith, believing, God will answer. And he gives me insights. And he tells me where to find, where to borrow brains. There's like nothing new uh, uh, that I shared this weekend. It's old stuff that God's reminded me of and says, bring it here. 
So I, I hope it's appropriate for you. But spiritual depletion is a big deal. Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I want to hear the Word of God. The more the better, because I want to grow. I don't want to be caught up in the affairs of this world. The affairs of this world draw me away from God. You know, the affairs of this world is you deserve a break today. You know I don't deserve a break today. You know what I really deserve. Uh, uh, you may not know this, but I sinned. Uh, it was a long time ago, of course, and, you know, but maybe God forgot about it, but I, I'm a sinner. And he said, so if I got what I deserve, where would I be today? Absolutely right. Thank you. I'd be in hell. I don't get what I deserve. So thank you, um, Lord. I get what I don't deserve. I get grace. I get love. I get mercy. I get forgiveness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm restored in my relationship to God Almighty, big God, the God of creation. So I, I need to have faith that he gives me. I don't want to become spiritually depleted. And uh, if you're weak in the faith, find strong people that will love you and care for you and help you. Number two, familiarity. I've been a Christian a long time. July 16th, uh, this past year, uh, is 40 years. July 16th, 1978 was the year I came to Christ. And uh, I praise God. I've been around a long time. I've been in a bunch of different churches preaching and teaching. I've also had several home churches as God's moved our family and ministry. Been around a long time. Church gets pretty familiar. A little different, but it's pretty familiar. And I don't want that familiarity to hinder me from going deep in an intimate love relationship with my God. Uh, surface Christianity doesn't, good, doesn't do well for me. I like Christian Christians. You know, there's Christians, and then there's Christian Christians. Uh, with the floods going on, we had our town flood up in Pennsylvania, and uh, um, uh, Samaritan's Purse and Eight Days of Hope and ministries like that came in. Uh, I came in, I met those people. They are the most Christian, Christian people. God changed my life this past summer as I went and had the privilege of serving with them in the flood area. Uh, they're the most Christian Christians I've ever met. They, they walk right, they don't, they don't, it's just the way they are. It's the way they be. It's not what they do. Th their motto is, hey, listen, um, anybody can scoop up mud and get it out of a basement. Uh, anybody can do that, but we're Christians. This is the orientation program. It says, say, uh, anybody can clean up mud. You need to minister agape to these people. So when the lady that just, we had a, a widow that, that lost everything, her husband, she's by herself, and she, she, and it turns out we go to her house and then she got the flyer, would you like some help? Yes, and she has tears running down her cheeks, and she's in a wheelchair. What are you doing in a wheelchair? And I looked down and her foot's in a cast. She broke her leg. I couldn't clean it up myself if I wanted to. Uh, how do I thank you, people? Why are you here? Well, Jesus sent us. No, really, really. Well, I can't do anything for you. You're not supposed to. This is just a free gift of charity. And she, she wept like a baby and people like that. And the people that I went and I saw doing this, they were real Christian Christians. You couldn't pay them to do it. And they did it out of heart of love. I can get real familiar, but I'm looking for real Christian Christians that are doing the work of the gospel. Number three, um, we can get selfish gratification. Less is a big deal today because we're saturated in the world. The, the world wants you to desire. They want you to lust after material things, sexual things. They want you to desire and crave and, and all for selfish gratification. That's a big deal. Uh, maybe you're disconnected. Number four, uh, there are not a whole lot of Christians that are truly connected uh, heart to heart. Does anybody know what you're struggling with spiritually? Does anybody know what you're really going through? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I have an accountability partner. Al knows what I'm going through, the good, the bad, the ugly. I had great temptations a couple of weeks ago. I figured it was the enemy attacking when I got through it. But Al knew what I was going through in my men's group, in my men's Bible study. We meet before work on Friday morning, and I told them, and they're praying for me. And I have some ladies that, that in the ladies' prayer group, and they're praying for you this weekend. And so I'm thrilled that I'm not isolated. Um, but uh, there's a list that in one of the other uh, pieces. I think it's in the, the booklet there, one anothering. There are like 36 different one another's we should do. Love one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, confess our faults one to another, reconcile with another. There's like 36 of them. I wonder how many connected. If you went through that list of 36 different one another's, I wonder how many, yep, I do that, yep, I do that. Oh, I don't do that, I don't do that. Well, and then we wonder why we're struggling because we're not living Christ. And uh, I'm, not, I'm here to encourage you, figure out. We talked about a growth plan. Uh, I share every, every year between Christmas and New Year's, I have time of reflection, and I want to figure out what's my growth for next year. I'm going to press towards the mark. What's the mark? 
How am I going to grow spiritually? How am I going to gr- grow uh, um, in, in, in relationship with my children, uh, relationship with my God, and relationship with my counseling ministry? And rela- how am I, what does God want me to grow into? Because I'm not done yet. If I was done, I wouldn't be here. God's not done with me yet. I don't know what I'm going to do in 2019 yet, but I'm going to have some targets to some press towards the mark, something to throw the darts at. And I'm going to try and figure out where I need to grow. Things that are available today, never, I, like fentanyl wasn't around when I was getting my certification to do drug and alcohol counseling. I got to learn a whole new thing. And this brain imaging thing, there's all new things for me to learn so I can be a more effective counselor. And we talked about that yesterday. So I don't want to be disconnected. I want one another people. That's number four and number five. Some people are just stubborn. And, and I, I don't know who you are. So please don't get mad at pastor. He didn't rat you out or anything. Neither did your husband or your wife. But there are some people who say, I'm just stubborn. Do you know what Proverbs says about stubborn? Number one, if you are stubborn, repent. But number two, if you're going to stay stubborn, don't broadcast it. Because you're going to be in trouble. Read Proverbs. You don't want to be stubborn, but there are stubborn. The, the beam in my eyes. I'm stubborn. I'm not getting it out of my eye. Okay, I don't want to be alongside you when the Lord decides to intervene. Uh, he's very long-suffering. You, you might not know that. In 1 Corinthians 13, in King James, it says charity. I like that word. In the, in the other version, it's love. Charity is long-suffering. I'm glad it's long-suffering. I'm glad for that, because one day, he says, okay, I waited long enough, now it's time. Steve, you're in the crucible, I'm going to ground you down. Oh, Lord, please don't do that. Uh, You didn't repent? Uh, Okay, grind me down, chew me up, spit me out, and redo me so I can be a new Stephen, be a better one than the old one. I'm asking for God's regenerating spirit to constantly work on my heart. So, number five, don't be stubborn. Number six, some people have justifiable resentment. You know, I think I was right. I didn't deserve what happened to me, and people hold on to resentment. And say, you know, what you want to do is be forgiving before they even ask for it. You know, in your own heart. It's kind of like when we were up in the Lancaster area. Uh, there was that, that shooting at that, that Mennonite school and stuff. And the people responded immediately with forgiving. And forgiving means cancel the debt, which means we don't, he doesn't owe us anymore. We're in pain. We're, I'm not sure he's safe. We're going to have good boundaries. Maybe he needs to go to jail or something. But we're not going to hold on to resentment. God's still God. It's ter- terrible. It's tragic. It's trauma. Uh, real trauma. But I don't want to hold on to resentments because that will eat you up alive. I know people that said, uh, you know, I will never forgive. Do you, or do you realize what you're saying if you hold on to that resentment? There's a root of bitterness that's really condemned in Scripture. You don't want to be that. You know, it's hurting you. They're, hey, they're dead and gone. or they're I'll never forgive my dad for whatever. So he's been dead for years and you're not going to forgive him? It doesn't matter to him anymore. Why are you doing this? It's a big deal. So... Uh, justifiable resentment, please don't do that. Uh, arrogant entitlement. Some people are taught, you know, you deserve it. That's some of the modern, the, the, like this eagle. I'm not interested in leaving any kids behind, but the l- leave no kid behind kind of stuff. Or when you go to the, the ball game, you know, every kid gets a first place trophy. Uh, we water things down and kids think they deserve stuff. Well, my son deserves to play or my daughter deserves to play. And it's like you're missing the boat. That's your affections are things of this world. I want my children to have the competitive experience, my grandchildren, but this attitude of entitlement, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, I'm okay if, uh, if they want to strive for good, but uh, it's kind of like, you know, I have a desire, and therefore, because I have a desire, that means I have the right, and if I have the right, then I deserve these things, and that's just not true because we deserve hell. We don't deserve any blessings, but God blesses anyway because he's a blessing God. It's wonderful. And so um, I don't have any rights. They're gone. You know, uh, well, I'm a husband and I have these rights. I'm a wife and I have these rights. It's, I don't have any rights. I, t- I like the R word, but it's not the R word that begins with rights. I like the R word that says I have responsibility. And I'm, like it or not, I, I don't have rights as a husband or a father. I have responsibility as a husband and a father. I have no rights. I surrendered them to Christ. And what I want to do is learn how to be worthy of respect rather than demanding rights. Because if you demand rights, you may get what you want, but you haven't gotten what you want. Think of it. I demand dinner on time. All right, so dinner's on time, but you haven't gotten what you want. How's the relationship with your girl? Not so good, huh? Well, uh, be careful about that. Um, uh, arrogant entitlement. Uh, nine letter number eight is similar. 
unresolved resentments and bitterness. We talked about forgiveness a minute ago. Um, resolve all your resentments. Uh, and a lot of us that will hold on to that resentment, we don't want to do a Matthew 18. We don't want to go to the person that, that offended us and tell them their fault. Oh, I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking to them. Well, the Bible's a Christianity. Christian Christians say, they hurt me. I'm going to go talk to them. And if they won't hear me, I'm going to bring a witness. You know, Christians don't do that. Christians say, oh, I'll just forget about it. That's not what the scriptures teach. If you've been offended, you have a responsibility to confront the person who hurt you. And if you think they're dangerous, bring someone with you. Uh, but w- especially in the house, it's, uh, we need to resolve. Um, and so, you know, people will just say, I'll just forget about it. Then they're going to do it again to somebody else. And that doesn't help the, the bride of Christ, the church. Um, we, we shouldn't uh, just let things go unresolved. Number nine, uh, ignorance. Some people don't know. Uh, I've been studying counseling for a long time now, and uh, I still find out there's things I don't know. I'm wondering how many people really understand how to reconcile. If you're here for the ABF, we went through a process that's in the book that talks about how do I reconcile with another person? What do I need? How do I put closure? Because typically when there's a fight, you remember the pain, and because you remember the pain, you bring up that incident and throw it in your spouse's face and say, well, you did this, that. I said, I thought you, I apologized for that. I thought I asked for forgiveness for that. I thought you buried that as far as the east is from the west. But the next fight, they bring it up again. So there becomes uh, a, an idea where it should be a resolution, and I ask, will you please forgive me? Now, if it hurts too bad, they may say, no, I can't right now, I'm in too much pain. Okay, we'll get you a bag of ice and give you some aspirin. When the pain goes away, maybe you'll be able to forgive me then. Well, that's a good idea. Um, but some people hold on to that resentment, and, or they'll forgive, and they begin to commit the sin of unforgiveness, where once I tell my wife, I forgive you, I never, that's an obligation. I will never, never, never bring that issue up again and throw it in her face. Why? Her debt has been canceled. She's been pardoned. I don't bring it up again. And now I have to learn how to resolve issues, but I can't resolve issues by bringing the forgiveness stuff out of forgiveness to unforgiveness. I'm not allowed to do that. Oh, I didn't know I was. Can I bring that up? That illustrates my point. Find another way. You can do that. Can I? Re- yeah, you can. If you need a coach, get a counselor. They're coaching. And we talked about counseling. You know, there's safety in the multitude of counselors. You know, the Bible says we should have counsel, just like Pastor read earlier. It's a big deal. We need counsel. And uh, I still need counsel. I, I don't have it all together. I'm learning. Uh, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to be studying next year to learn more good stuff, but I'm going to be studying next year. Well, uh, the time I pray, by the grace of God, I'll be able to read. I'll always have my eyesight. I'll have my mind, and I'll continue to grow. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I want to understand Scripture better. And so we can do that. So um, ignorance is a big deal. Number nine. Number ten is fear of the unknown. Um, the, you know what the solution for fear is? If you're afraid, what should you do? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. The solution for fear is faith. I'm so glad out of all the spiritual gifts, I think the gift of faith that he gave me to believe, I've never doubted salvation. I feel so sad for people that doubt their salvation. One thing about everybody I've worked with so far that worries, did I lose my salvation? They're saved. Lost people do not worry about losing salvation. They never had it. The only people that worry about losing their salvation, in my experience, is Christians. I say, if you weren't a Christian, you wouldn't worry about it. But you're a Christian. You're saved. You're born again. So the gift of faith, it's a beautiful thing. So hold firm in your faith, I pray. Number 11 is uh, fragile emotions. As you talk about fragile emotions, uh, you know, people said I was too sensitive. I don't know what too sensitive is. I have feelings. I cry at every Hallmark movie. So, you know, uh, guilty as charged. But emotions, they should be, you should be authentic. Instead of stop your crime before I give you something to cry about, you should be allowed to feel your feelings. And so if you're going to feel your feelings, be open and honest. Uh, don't take this line that you, that you shouldn't feel that way. Um, I tell people that say, well, they shouldn't feel that way. I said, no, that's not true. I'm so sorry for you. You don't have great highs and you don't have great lows. You don't get really sad and you get really happy. You're limited in your emotional, your sensitive experience. I, I have feel sensations. Man, I cry bad. When I hurt, I hurt huge, I hurt. But when I love, I love fantastic. I love big. I love to love. But these people with blunt personalities, they're, not, they're just different. They're not bad or good. But don't condemn me for being a guy that cries really bad and celebrates really good. 
Uh, we need to. And in order to deal with emotions properly, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, but if you're going to deal with emotions properly, then you need to be able to experience your sensations. You can't numb them. You can't dummy them down. You need to feel your feelings. And if you feel your feelings, then you have to label them. That's why you've probably seen those pieces of paper with a whole bunch of smiley faces on, and, say, and they say, uh, you know, all these different expressions of mad, glad, sad, and a whole bunch excited, and all these different facials. They want you to identify what your experience is. Mad, glad, sad. Where are you on the charts? And so you need to feel your feelings and then you need to be able to label your feelings. But the emotional cycle is not closed yet because just because I know what I'm feeling, I'm feeling ecstatic. Which picture is ecstatic? Oh, ecstatic, yeah, that's the one I want. So that's what I'm feeling. So if I'm feeling ecstatic, then I want to be able to share that safely with my beloved bride and say, hey, sweetheart, I'm really feeling ecstatic at the moment. It's, the circle's not closed yet. It closes up when she says, oh, Steve, you're ecstatic. Now there's the, conne- I know the connection is there. But if you don't feel your feelings, label your sharing, your feelings, share your feelings, and have them acknowledged and validated, the, the circle's not there. So, and then say, well, I'm, my wife and I, we're not in love anymore. Well, are you connected emotionally? And no, well, she doesn't talk about her feelings anymore. Why? Because you crushed them? Uh, maybe. And so that you're not safe to share, for her to share your feelings with. So learn, go back, get a coach. Don't, don't hurt each other. Label, uh, feel your feelings, label your feelings, share your feelings, and have them acknowledged and validated and honor and treasure. Then you feel so good. Thank you for knowing my heart of hearts and not hurting me with it. Wow, now I have an affection for you. Now I have a desire for you. That's part of the reconciliation between families, uh, couples that have fallen out of love. Don't live there. Get it fixed as we go on. So there's a little bit about... Um, Fragile emotions. Uh, number 12 is exhaustion. Uh, we get too busy. Same workers in the church do it, and everybody else takes a break. And uh, you can get exhausted in the church. Sometimes uh, you, you need to find, there's a book called Margin. It's how to put margin back in your life when you overextend yourself, kind of like I'm guilty of. I'm constantly trying to say, wait, where's the margin in my life? Where can I chill out? And uh, so that's a big deal. And number 13 is probably the one that kicks me the most. I said I'd share mine. Because of my upbringing, I was constantly dealing with the shame thing. I always felt really ugly inside. And uh, the the back story is I I was cross-eyed. I needed glasses since I could wear glasses. Um, I had real blotchy freckles uh, complexion, uh, out in the sun, pink skin all the time. Uh, I grew up in the 60s, and in the 60s, when everybody had long hair, my mommy didn't like that, so she gave me a buzz, a crew cut, you know, military haircut, and uh, I always looked odd with my big glasses that were very thick Coke bottle, and my, my ears, they, she was afraid they'd fall off, so that she had those kind that go around your ears and hold them out, and so I had ears like this, and um, uh, blotchiness and short hair, and you know, it, even the way I dressed, she dressed me. You know, beetle boots were in back then. You probably don't. That'll age me for those of you that remember the beetles and the beetle boots. Uh, I had to have my wear shoes like my grandfather wingtips. And I'll tell you what, I stood out of the class. I was one of a kind. I don't wear wingtips very often today. I wonder why. Uh, but uh, involved in that, what did that do to me? You know, my. If you knew the day, Howdy Doody was really popular. Uh, you could hold my picture up to Howdy Doody, and we looked like we were twin brothers. It, it was that serious. And uh, so in the process of that, um, the shame message is like, God, is what I wanted didn't really count. It didn't really matter. Uh, the first eye of four eyes is I felt insignificant, not a good thing. Second thing, I felt very inadequate. Um, I graduated high school like about 126, 127 pounds. I was a skinny little kid. I grew in college, thankfully. Um, but I was a skinny little kid. Now I wish I could get rid of some of the, and you know what I mean. Uh, but back then I was a skinny little kid and I was weak and I was frail. And so I, I felt so uh, belittled at going through most of high school. I felt inadequate. I wasn't strong enough to get on a wrestling team or play a football game or anything. I was just, I was just a weak little kid. And I always felt inferior. And so I felt inadequate that I didn't have what I needed. I felt like I had deficits. And thank God, he is, I have everything I need. I am complete in Christ. To God be the glory. I, don't, I am fully adequate for what he designed me to do. I can't do what he called you to do. I can't do what the music team did. You don't want me leading the singing. Uh, you, you don't want me in the back tech group. You don't want me there. Yeah, you want me, believe it or not, I'm safer here than anywhere else in the church. So, so, but I always felt inadequate. I am fully adequate for what God called me to do. Uh, third I, uh, insignificant, in, inadequate, incompetent. I felt like I couldn't do anything right. 
And I, once I found Christ and people said, I can do all things through Christ, I took that to the max. I thought I could do things that I truly couldn't do, but I thought I did. And I'm not a senior pastor in a church. I, I can pastor, I was pastoring, but that's not my greatest gifts. And so it's kind of fruit, more fruit, much fruit. What do you want to yield in your life? Fruit, more fruit, or much fruit? Good, better, best. And so it became a theme in my life. I want to do what I'm best designed to do. You are best designed to do something that nobody else is designed to do. You're one of a kind. It's when I used to go evangelizing uh, door to door, and um, the the coach, uh, the pastor there would say, there's someone out there waiting for Stephen to show up. Go find him. And I believe that. There's a church down here near Annapolis that is waiting for Steve to show up. I don't know why, but I pray the Holy Spirit is working in some of your hearts, if not all your hearts, at least somebody in here is looking down this list and saying, now I understand why I haven't been growing. Now I understand why I haven't been healing because I've been holding on to this, this resentment, this ignorance, this, this uh, whatever it is, I've been holding on to it. But God has told me that you need to hear, you can do the ministry he has called you to do. So please serve God, that most high God. And the last I, insignificant, inadequate, incompetent, impotent. I felt like I didn't have the strength. And one day someone taught me about the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is indwelling? And the Holy Spirit of Creator God, in the beginning God God, His Holy Spirit that that roamed upon now dwells within me. He has taken up residence in me. And the Bible says, greater is he that's in me and you than he that's in the world, which means no matter what bully comes down the sidewalk, if God called me to do it, I'm going to be okay to do it. And whatever trials and tribulations, uh, testing, temptations, and troubles, whatever suffering that goes on, it's okay. I have really, really, really struggled with shame through different periods of my life. I think, if not for all, most, if not all, uh, I'm, a lot of things I am, shame's not one of them. Uh, I've done stupid things. I can humiliate myself, but the shame is gone. I realize that God has richly blessed you and me, and he has designed you uniquely to do your ministry. So I plead with you. Our church here needs to do it. You know, I was saved, uh, and I wasn't completely sanctified. God's done a lot of work in my heart, and but the Holy Spirit has been faithful to convince me of my wrongness, and I've been repentant. And I will have trials and struggles, but I need, and I like the sequence, I love progression, how am I going? I I need honesty, I I need acknowledgement, I need to know where I'm wrong. And when I recognize where I'm wrong, then I need healing from that brokenness. And after I heal for a little while, then there's going to be some new growth that comes upon. And after that new growth comes, I have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit that dwells within to accomplish. So if I'm humbly serving him, I have to be teachable, willing to receive. That's why I continue to get educated. Uh, If I ever would be honored with the privilege of coming back here again, I'm going to have different and new stuff. Someone asked me, have I done this weekend before? No, I can't do that. If I do the same thing I did 10 years ago, what growth is that? I'm going to get back into the word all new and afresh and say, God, what will thou have me to do here at this wonderful church with your children? God, what do you want me to do at this, uh, this fall Bible conference? It's a big deal. And I don't want this time of yours wasted. I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit's bringing it in and you're using it and it's all good. Uh, so when we fail, I just admit, hey, God, it's a failure. Now I need you to make up the difference, and he does. He is so faithful. So I appreciate my great God, and I want to learn how to love him better this day and every day forward. I want to learn, uh, learn how to love you better by the grace of God. Let's pray. Father God, I don't even want to stop. I just thank you so much for this privilege and this pastor and these fine people and the warmth and the love they've given to me. Lord, I'm so thankful. But I pray for the one, the one here that's in this room today, and they may not even know Christ, Lord, so I don't know how much of this teaching they can absorb, but I know that you love them, and I believe this church will love them too. So if there's one here today that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you give them the safety and the courage to come forward and tell one of the pastors here or someone in the church that uh, they're not sure they understand salvation or that they understand they want to be saved. Lord, I pray your blessing. For those that are visiting the church, I pray you'd be blessing them and they'd feel safe and I haven't done anything to hinder their relationship with this church, but in fact, maybe encouraged it. Lord, if there's uh, people in the church that are struggling with their own growth, they're, they're not getting where they believe you would have them go. 
one of these hindrances, these stumbling blocks, these, these beams that are in the way, Lord, I pray that they wrestle with you, get it out of the way, and fulfill their, their task, their challenge, their blessing to serve you and become all you designed them to be. Lord, I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.